Hello everyone, this is Maggie Moteka from BESCO. I would like to welcome you to our um, webinar. Today we're going to be talking about composites and Dr. Michael Morgan will be doing the presentation. Please write all your questions uh, in Q&A. Thank you. Here you go, Dr. Morgan. Thank you, Maggie. Um, good morning from beautiful Schaumburg, Illinois, home of BISCO. Uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about simplified posterior composites. And um, if the doctors and, and other folks have questions as we go along, we'll be glad to take those all at the end of today's presentation. So let's move on here. So BISCO is um, obviously sponsoring our little program today. And if you folks want to go on to Facebook, BISCO has a, a new Facebook page where you can get the latest updates on services, products, information, and um, post comments on products. and. Um, and any questions that you might have, we can help you with as well. So let's launch into this. So this is what my daughter says I look like in the morning before I have my, my coffee and, and other things to get kind of get going for the day. Um, and this is how my patients see me as we kind of proceed along. So posterior direct composites, those are the bread and butter of every practice. Those are what we see every day. That's what walks in the door every morning. Um, you know, it's nice to have the big complicated cases, but, but this is you know, real world dentistry. This is what everybody sees everywhere in every country all the time. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So the quest, the quest is to take something that's very unnatural, amalgam. It's ugly. It does nasty things to teeth and transform those teeth into something that's very aesthetic, much stronger, um, makes the patients happy, gives the doctors some personal satisfaction as well. So let's talk about direct composite restorations. They're, they're pretty darn simple. Basically, you're going to take, you know, if we look at this um, amalgam here, an old amalgam patient has, you just remove what's not healthy. So take away the amalgam, take away any decay, anything else you don't like. So there's no GV black extension for prevention like we had for amalgam, like we learned in dental school. Just basically take out what's bad and replace it with what's good. Um, there is a little bit of a what we call marginal bevel, bevel in the sense of freshening up the enamel rods along the, the margins of the preparation, not like a big dental school bevel where you take a giant burr and you know put a 45 degree angle on there. You just want to freshen it up to get a better etch pattern. And then that's the, um, the final restoration. So we'll, we'll discuss this a little later. Basically just two shades, a dentin shade and an enamel shade to give a patient a really nice long-lasting, durable, proven restoration. So let's start out with something a little simpler with a class one restoration. So here we have a, a defective amalgam, We've got an old sealant. They both have marginal decay. See my pointer works. There we go. So my favorite instrument to use to get rid of amalgams, to start crown preps, to do pretty much anything is a 330S short shank, the little pear shapers. So we take out all the old amalgam, take out the old sealant, anything else we don't like. And then I talked before about the bevel. The bevel is really just cleaning up the enamel rods, the edges, so we get the maximum etch we can get there. And you can use you know, a round burr to do that. You can use a football burr to do that. And after we rinse and clean that up, here we're going to talk about total etch. Later we'll talk a little bit about self-etch. So you want to etch the enamel for 20 seconds, which you're doing here, and then the dentin for five. And you're going to rinse that off. So here's a uh, little tip for the clinicians. One of the best ways to, to make sure you have the right amount of either, you can call it wetness or, or water or dampness or whatever you want to call it for total etch, is simply to take the high-speed evac, have your assistant put it over the preparations, and have her suction out. Just like real quick, a quick second there, get out as much water as she can get and not blow these dry or air dry them or over dry them because that's one of the causes of, of sensitivity is not having these preparations be have the proper amount of moisture. So, And if you have excess water left, you can blot it out with a micro brush. You could use cotton pellets, foam pellets, whatever you like. And the, the, the key here is you want to have the dentin to be wet slash damp slash moist before we're going to do Total etch. So then you can take Alban 3 and you're going to apply part A and part B 
per the instructions for the enamel and the dentin. And then there we go. When, when that, you have a nice shiny color when you're all done, shiny appearance. And then you want to light cure or light activate that for 20 seconds. And this is a big, this is the ultra loom light, the big giant light. Has a, I like this because it has a huge footprint. You can do, as you can see here, you have a, a molar and a premolar. You can almost do three teeth with this. It's also really nice in the anterior when doing multiple restorations. So the next step is we're going to apply half a millimeter of Elite Flow on, over the floor of the prep. So this is to take care of um, making sure that you don't trap any air underneath the, um, the body composite that you're going to use or the dentin composite you're going to use. You're going to spread this over the floor of the pulp. You can use uh, an explorer. You can use a perioprobe and spread that over and then light cure it. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to stratify our composites. So these are some cutaway slides of stratification from Dr. Dietschy. So you have down here you have dentin layers stratified. You have, he has enamel. Then he even has translucent layers and a little bit of color if you want to do that. And here's a, more of a, a drawing of the, of the same procedure. And what we're trying to do here is reduce the amount of stress that we're inducing into the tooth because if you fill this, entirely with composite and light cure it, you're going to pull this cusp towards this cusp. And if you've ever done this in, say, like a, an upper bicuspid, you'll see a lot of times on the paladal, if this gets real thin, you'll see after or immediately when you light cure it, there'll be a big fracture line here. Ask me how I know that happens because I've done it a few times. So you want to make sure you, you stratify these, especially the deeper they are, the more you want to stratify them. So in the dentin layer, you can use Elite or reflections, and these are added in increments, so we're offsetting that shrinkage or C-factor to reduce the amount of stress. So you can add, and these are smaller preparations, so you could add on the buckle and cure that and then add on the lingual and then leave room for an enamel layer afterwards. So once again, I kind of tack these down each layer for two to five seconds. Um, it's recommended that they be fully cured 20 seconds for every one to two millimeters of thickness. So here the enamel layer is being placed with a small instrument. It's a coposcope instrument. And you can use either elite or reflections. And these are one millimeter or less in depth. And if they're more than that, then you do have to stratify them as well. So those are placed. You put a little anatomy in there. And then they're light cured, and then we place, you can place deox, you can place um, anything that's a barrier to oxygen, so you cure the oxygen inhibited layer, you put Vaseline on there, whatever you like, light cure these, clean that off, then they're light cured, light cured again. And then I use a fine diamond on high dry, meaning there's no water, just to clean up the edges of the margins right here, make sure everything's nice and smooth. And do it again. And some of the, you know, the acorn burrs, or the, the anatomical burrs are real popular. The problem is um, if you're going to do this like dental school, meaning if you're going to overfill this and then cut it down like you would with an amalgam, you're going to put a tremendous amount of stress on the composite. If you looked at it under a microscope, you'd see there's huge cracks, divots, all sorts of destruction all along this really beautiful composite you just placed. So I would rather try to place these right to where they're supposed to be rather than over bulk them and cut them down. And you can uh, do kind of the basic polishing with something like an enhance cup or point. And brownie points are great for finishing up. Brownie points are wonderful because they'll take just a little bit, a microscopic amount of enamel down as well as composite. Some other things are too aggressive. They cut away enamel or they cut away composite as well. And then we're going to use some jiffy brushes to get these shined up. The pointed ones get down nicely into the grooves, and the flatter ones will get more to the outside of the preparation. And afterward, we're going to use, after the, the isolation was removed, then use Biscover LV to seal over. Because any area that's been finished, no matter how finely it's been finished, still has some micro cracks in the composite. So we're going to use the bisque cover to fill in those areas, seal over the restoration. And what we'd like to see, let me go back here, 
is when we pop off the rubber dam and then we have the patient bite, we'd like to see them be pretty close to being incentric. So we have these little marks here, the patient's pretty close, and that way we have minimum amount of finishing afterwards. So we're gonna, next thing we're gonna do is talk about class two. Okay, talk about some class two. So this, these are old composites. I've been around patients had for a long time and we're going to replace them. In this case, we're going to use reflections to do this particular case. So let's talk a little bit about the shades of reflections because we've had some questions from some doctors and some of the distributors about how we, how we pick shades and how they're appropriate for this material. So from my, my perspective or my experience with using this material, I find that most of the time I use just three shades from the kit. So I use the dark denton more than 80% of the time, and then either neutral or the gray enamel. So let's look at the shade guide here a little bit and talk about that. And we'll blow it up a little bigger. So you can see on the shade guide kit, there's a dark denton. So most of the time, for me, particularly for a posterior tooth, that's going to be the most appropriate denton shade to use from the reflections kit. So it's going to give me some opacity. It's going to block out maybe any staining you have from old amalgam, decay, other um, things that might have been in there. And then after that's placed, then we're going to have a thin layer of either the gray enamel or the neutral enamel. Um, there are times, you know, there are patients who want, um, you know, lighter teeth, but I find that the uses for, let's say, like the bleach dentin, that happens more in the, actually in the anterior than in the posterior. So the, the, the big advantage for me for dark dentin is it blocks out discoloration and then it gives it the amount of opacity I want because I don't want something real translucent. And we'll show a case here where actually where I used, I used a dark dentin, but then I used the frost enamel and it's a little too light. So in the posterior for most patients, you're going to be here and then these two enamels. So we take out the old, the old base, all, all the goo and gunk that was under there, and it goes under the cusp. These are pretty deep. These are actually pretty big preparations and approximately. So without, you know, rubber, inverting the rubber dam with and using floss, it would be extremely difficult to get isolation way down in there. So matrix bands, from a matrix band standpoint, you know, we have tons of choices. You know, over two dozen choices. My favorites are the Garrisons and the Triclips, the V3s. So in this case, you're going to see, you'll see the V3s, and then the next one you see actually see both. And as far as instruments, I like Composcopes from Suter. They're four different tips, and it pretty much covers all the bases for me for a posterior tooth. It's nice because you can cut nice anatomy with the with the green instrument. You can place with the, the red and the yellow. And they're also in primary colors, which is great because some doctors can remember those, you know, 12-digit numbers for the instruments. I can't. So it's real easy for me to ask my assistant, you know, can I have the yellow one or the red one? Okay, so we're going to, after we've we showed the preparation, to place the matrices for from the V3 and then use visco cavity cleanser, the chlorhexidine and rinse this out, clean it out real thoroughly, rinse it out. And this is a hybrid etch technique, so you don't, you don't have to do this, but if you're going to use self-etch, which in this case we're going to, and if you have any concerns about what kind of etch pattern you're going to get on the enamel, you could always do a hybrid technique that's placing etch just on the enamel, and you could very carefully place it down here as well in the box with the word carefully being emphasized and rinse that out and then use the self-etch to etch the dentin. So that's what we're doing here using all bond SC. And one of the nice things about this particular adhesive is it changes color, so it's real easy for the assistants to know they've mixed it properly and it's ready to use. So you want to look for the pink, the pink color. And it's also nice, my assistant Ursa loves it now because it comes in the ACE dispenser, makes her life a lot easier, which makes my life a lot easier. So you're going you're gonna to place that, you're going to air dry it, and you're going to light cure it for 10 seconds. Then the next step would be to take some Elite Flow and place it on the gingival floor. So we're doing that place on gingival floor, a little bit down in the box, 
and then we're going to take an explorer or a perioprobe, in this case a perioprobe, and make sure that we spread this around and you want to get it right down to make sure that it, it adapts intimately between the matrix, the metal, and the gingival margin down here in the proximal box, and then light cure it. And you want to be mindful, the deeper these are, the deeper the preparations are, the longer it's going to take to cure this, simply because of the distance. So there's a big difference between having a preparation that's a millimeter deep, and these may be, say, it might be five or six millimeters from the cable surface margin all the way down to the gingival margin in the proximal box, and that's a long way for the light to go. So you have to adjust accordingly. If they're deeper, you have to cure longer. So what I do, and here I use dark denton like I talked about a couple minutes ago, dark denton layer in two increments. So one on the buckle, cure it. One on the lingual, cure it. And then I left enough room for one layer of, in this case it's neutral enamel, the reflections, and I place it in one increment. And I use a brush to smooth it off because that makes finishing minimal when you're all done. And of course this one was done with the reflections as well beforehand. So these are the restorations after. So we're going to take off the rubber dam, check the patient's bite, and we're going to etch, rinse, and then discover LV the seal over any areas I may have damaged when I finish the restorations. So in this case, we have a nice color match. So here's an example of dark dentin, again, with neutral enamel. This is a little young, uh, you know, it's a younger patient. For, let's say, a more mature patient, you could lean towards the gray enamel. And I'll show you one case in a minute here I did with the frost. So Biscover, I use that for finishing all, after finishing all my posterior restorations. So these are, you know, we're talking about posterior composites, but I use it um, for inlays and onlays. I use it in the anterior when we got, when we're finished um, with restorations. I use it for temporaries as well. So in this case, this is a class two. I finished roughing and uh, polishing it. Get the occlusion all adjusted, and then etch the resin for 20 seconds, rinse it off, apply the Biscover. This is a little, actually a little older slide. There's a brush that comes with the Biscover LV, the little blue and white brushes. So you apply that and light cure it for 40 seconds. And those are the restorations after. So they have a, a nice shine, but more important, they're well sealed all the way from the enamel it to the restoration, and then the restoration itself is sealed, and the little micro fractures. So let's talk about class twos. We're going to shift over to, I showed a couple, some cases here with reflections. I'm going to show one with elite. So this is for a patient who, um, a patient of mine, he's an artist, and he was really fanatical about wanting his teeth to look exactly like his adjacent teeth, his unrestored teeth. So most patients are fine with they like nice function, they like nice aesthetics, but let's be honest, they don't really see what their posterior teeth look like. But in this case, he wanted me to, to take pictures, he wanted to see what things look like. So this is a more a function of A, you know, using Elite, which is a very aesthetic composite, and B, spending more time for this patient. So he had old sealants, or an old sealant and an old amalgam. So there's the old sealant, there's the old amalgam, take those out and this is an older sectional matrix from the older garrisons with a wedge put in and one a little tip here that I'll share again later for the doctors is if you want to make your life easier then take the band and instead of letting it let's say stick up two or three millimeters past the adjacent tooth which causes you to overbuild then put a notch in it you can use any kind of diamond burr around around one would be nice and so notch this down to the just above the height of the adjacent tooth. And what that'll do is it gives you a marker to shoot for in terms of the height of the marginal ridge. And once you have that, then you can build the rest of the restoration. And it'll be pretty close to contour, and you won't have to destroy all the composite you took so long to place. So in this case, we're going through the, you know, the proper adhesive protocol, putting in a lead flow like we talked about down into the proximal box, light curing that. And this is called a centripetal buildup. That's a procedure in which 
you take any proximal wall that's missing, mesial, distal, buccal, lingual, build it back, and create basically what's a class one, which is a lot easier. If you'd ask a doctor, okay, what's easier to, to restore, class one or class two? It's always a class one. You're just filling in basically the central part when the periphery is already taken care of. So with class twos, I try to turn them all into class ones first and then go back and finish them up. So in this case, we took a little bit of, uh, this is actually Elite, the WE built up the proximal wall, light cure that, and then start adding dentin layers. There we go, there's a proximal wall built up, dentin layers. And this is kind of, I'll call, old school, or I used to spend a lot of time putting stain and color and things like that in there, but to be honest, patients really don't like this stuff. And it's more, I think this is more doctor-driven now than, than patient-driven. In fact, if, they, uh, if you do this on a lower tooth and they see it, they'll usually ask you to take it back out. So this is, this is characterization, and then we use some artist brushes here to smooth out the enamel. And there we have a really nice class two with nice function, nice aesthetics. So the difference between this and some of the previous cases is, one, I did it with Elite, and two, there's a lot more time involved. So do I do this for all patients? Absolutely not, because this is probably, it's about triple the time that I would normally spend on something like this. But for patients who want it, you know, and they want to spend the time and they want to, um, you know, have the fee that go, goes with that, we're more than happy to do that for them. And it, it's nice to have the option and to be able to have a, a product that'll give you that kind of restoration. Okay, so let's, this is a question I get all the time in lectures and hands-on courses is, how do I deal with multiple class twos? You have a patient come in and, you know, if they have one class two restoration, that's not a real big deal, but what if they have, like here, they have four of them. Okay, if you, if you think about it on, from one extreme to the other, if you took every single tooth and restored it individually, it would take a ton of time to go down the line, restore, 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 finish, restore, and to maintain all the proximals on all these. So this is, you know, there's no fast way to do this, but there's a faster or let's say a more efficient way to do it. So what I would do is you take your class twos and then you count up the areas where you have proximals open. So I have a mesial here, a mesial here, Here's distal, distal, distal. So I've got three of those, a few mesials. So these are, I know this looks like something out of a really bad Transformer movie. There's metal all over the place, things going on. These are simply to protect um, the root surfaces. If you take, in this case it's all bond C, if you take any kind of adhesive and you don't restrain it, if you don't keep it in the areas of the preparation where it's supposed to be, even with the rubber dam, some of it's going to flow down onto the root surface and it's going to cure. And then you're going to have an area, an irritant that patients can't clean. They'll get gingivitis. Worse, they might get periodontitis, which would be really not a good thing because that's not what they came in. They came in with some decay. They didn't come in, come in with periodontal disease. So this is the restrain, the adhesive. So my assistant makes these bands real quick. We put them on, place the all bond SC, light cure it, and then pop them all off. This looks real complicated, but it doesn't take very long. It'll save you a ton of headaches down the road here. So here's what I talked about about taking, you know, all either all the mesials or all the distals. In this case, I took the mesial and the mesial here, and put matrice in for each of those and, and wedged them, and then did the centripetal buildup. So a little bit of enamel composite, enamel composite, like cure it, and then take off the bands. So here. Now we're moving towards doing the class ones like we talked about. And then here we've got distal, 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 and I popped on. So here you have kind of like the combo platter. Here you have some garrisons, you have some tri clips, you can interchange them, and we're gonna make sure that we get proper contacts here and we get a little bit of separation between the teeth. And then when the centripetal buildups are done, now we have a class one. Same, same, same. So now we can finish these up. And so I did a little bit of dentin and then I did the enamel. So here's, um, it's always good to, to learn lessons from mistakes. So my mistake here was when you place a composite, especially when you have rubber dam, teeth dehydrate. When teeth dehydrate, they get lighter. When they get lighter, the composite that you place when you're finished should be slightly 
darker than the restoration. So if you place the composite and it matches the tooth like it does here, that means that you chose too light of a composite. So I chose too light of an enamel shade here. So I picked the frost and I should have used either the neutral or the gray. So that's, it holds true in anteriors and in posteriors as well. So when you're done, typically I'm telling the patient, okay, these, your fillings, your composite, your restoration is a little darker and tomorrow will look great. Today looks good, but tomorrow will look great. In this case, they look great when I got done. That meant they're a little too light. So when we take these off, you'll see the composite just a little too light. So they're, they're functional. He's going to have these for a long, long time. It's just a little too light, and um, you know, I asked Jeremy if he wanted me to go in and like touch these up a little, and he's fine. You know, most patients they want function, they want comfort. You know, aesthetics is nice, but they don't notice a lot of little nuances we do, especially we're looking at it under photography, we're looking at it under loops. It's kind of a it's a little different basis for uh, you know how we perceive our work. Um, a couple other little hints here. I know we're talking about posteriors, but a lot of time when we're restoring these teeth, we're forced into either making really flat teeth or somewhat altered occlusion because the patient's worn away their anterior. So something you might want to look at is checking the patient's anterior disclusion, their canine rise and their protrusive. And if they're missing, why wouldn't you want to just restore that for them? Because it's real simple. It's one shade of composite. You're just roughing up a little enamel, etching, applying an adhesive, and adding that, providing, of course, the patient a gives their permission and, and B wants to, you know, take care of the fee for this procedure. But restoring their um, their canine rise, which gives you more freedom when you're doing the anatomy on the posterior tooth. So this is a really simple procedure. So you can see that the, this patient has group function all the way across. And after here's I've added a little bit of composite just to the canines and now the patient goes in the canine rise and they've got disclusion instead of group function. So now the molar that I'm working on in the back next, I can do, you know, I have more freedom in terms of the anatomy that I can do there. We talked a little bit earlier about notching the proximal wedge. So here's another example of, you know, putting this, in, you know, older style band, putting that in and instead of laying this right up high, taking a burr, notching it down, and making sure we give ourselves a nice landmark to shoot for. And in, in class one composites in the posterior, 80% of the time you're gonna use either like an A35 dentin or the dark dentin and the reflections and one enamel shade. So that'll cover most of the teeth that you do. The, the, um, the, the ones that you'll have to work around a little bit will be either the older patients who come in who have a much darker tooth or the super, super young patients who have a much lighter tooth. But that's going to be, you know, the bulk of our demographics is going to be one dentin shade and one enamel shade. And with multiple class twos, you can make your life a lot easier by turning them in the class ones first and then finishing them up. Okay. And here's the same thing with even with severely broken down teeth. These should really be, you know, onlays or crowns with a patient leaving the country for a few months. So we built these up and do, you know, I would call them long-term temporaries. And a, a little, a couple of doctors asked me about this the last hands-on class I did. What do I do when I have a tooth that has really like dark dentin or a stain? So this patient had an old amalgam, we took it out. All the decay's gone here. There's still a little decay for me to get there. But how are we gonna get rid of this? The only way to get completely rid of it is to prep down into the pulp. And most patients aren't gonna trade a root canal for a, you know, a little more aesthetics. But what we can do is get everything cleaned up. This is completely caries free, but it's still stained. If you put a really nice composite over this, it's gonna show through and it's gonna look gray. So you'll have a little bit of an aesthetic issue. The, the, my bigger concern is what happens when this patient, let's say they move to you know, another part of the country and a dentist takes a look at this. They look on the x-ray, it looks okay, but they just, they're trying to figure out, is that gray because there's leakage? Is that gray because the doctor before me didn't take all the decay out? So let's, let's eliminate any you know, lingering doubts somebody else might have. So you can take pink, flowable composite, because pink is a complementary color or the contrary color to 
dark black or gray and pay, place that over and light cure it it's it's like a flow bowl so there are, there are a couple of different companies that make either pink opaquers or pink flow bowls you place that over and then you can take your elite or your reflections and now instead of having gray right here which is going to make the next dentist wonder what's going on you have a nice you know pretty aesthetic pretty functional restoration so that that kind of concludes our little posterior composite discussion for today and once again we'd appreciate if people would go on to check out Bisco's new Facebook page and you're all welcome to join us for our next webinar and in that one we're going to talk about anterior composites so we'll go over some different situations we're going to go over some small we're talking about some small class fours you know how can you get when patients come in they have these little chips and breaks and things younger patients how can you get those cleaned up and get them to look like the teeth did get them to look natural before they uh, like they did before they ran into the bottom of the swimming pool or or uh, fell off their trike and then we'll talk about some moderate size class fours with characterization so sometimes you see kids and they have these crazy um, they have a lot of microanatomy they have little white lines they've got these what Fanini calls clouds all over the place and how do you restore those so that you give the patient something that looks like you know they, they kind of grew their tooth back so mom's happy and dad's happy and the child's happy and then there's a little closer view and we'll talk about some more complex cases where patients come in and they have a class 4 that's really kind of like a giant composite veneer so how do you deal with something that has um, you know there's actually two restorations hidden in there there's the old class 4 under here and there's the big composite veneer and how do you restore that and give the patient some um, you know some natural restoration without prepping it down for a crown because the toughest thing to do in dentistry would be to take this at least for me take this prep it and do a single crown and get it to match there it's a lot easier to use composite and um, patients are pretty happy and these are adult patients so one of the things I've learned from my my kids is um, to always be thankful and say thank you so I want to say thank you to all the doctors and distributors and, and other attendees who sat in on time here okay and um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take questions okay so people Maggie's sitting here <laughs> at the ready for yeah Maggie's manning the phones Maggie's manning the phones so any, any questions that anyone has about anything we talked about today or even if it's you know off that subject a little bit we'll be glad to get into so how are we doing so far. No, nobody's got questions. Come on, questions are always a good thing. We, bu we buffered in some time here for questions. Composite, broke up, whatever. Olympics. Sure. Yeah, want to or just ask? Huh? Yeah. Thank you. No, we we'll just asked. Dr. Joffe's got a question. Dr. Joffe's joining us today. There you go. He wanted to be incognito, right? Uh, sorry, I just put him on the spot. So where do I type the question? Uh, just, no, just ask. Oh, just ask. ask. Yeah. I'm sitting right oh, here. <laughs> just go ahead and ask. Is it any easier way to handle multiple uh, proximal contacts when you're dealing with uh, posterior teeth? That's a good question. Dr. Jaffe asked, is there an easier way to, to deal with multiple class twos? I mean, that's the, I don't think there's any easy way to do it. I think that's probably one of the m most efficient and let's say less, least stressful ways I've been able to come up with. Excuse me. It's still stressful. I mean, multiple class twos are always stressful because there's nothing like having a patient, you know, a new patient come in and they've just had two or three or four class twos done and they've got these giant open contacts and they want to have that explained and you know, my doctor said they there's no way to close these there are it just takes you know it's not easy to do so I, I don't Dr. Joffe I don't think there's any easy way to do it it's just try to make it as easy as we can um, let's see. Okay. what's wrong with just that? 
I have another question. Okay, Dr. Jaffe has another question. <laughs> What's wrong uh, in doing class two with one type of composite like microteal? Okay. Aesthetic enamel. Okay. It's pretty strong. It, the wear is very low, and it's good polishing, good handling too. Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing it. I mean, I, yeah, the microfill is um, it has better wear characteristics. It's not as strong as better wear characteristics. So I would think in in small restorations, like I, you know, I have some posterior composites from in my own mouth from about 20 years ago. They're small, and they're they're microfills, and they've held up pretty well. But I think when you get out into like a class two, you've got all that stress on the marginal ridge and that area of the tooth, I think at the very least underneath that you would want some kind of hybrid, micro hybrid, nano hybrid, some kind of hybrid for strength, and then you could put you know, a microfoil of that if you wanted. I'd be a little concerned about the durability of something like that if it was just strictly microfill. It's kind of like doing a big class four in microfill, and those tend to fracture, they look great, but I'll, there are cases where I'll do class fours with the hybrid underneath and then and then cover it with a microfill so it's very pretty, better wear, better polish, but it's still strong. Does that kind of make sense or yeah? Okay. <laughs> Lightning note? Yeah, yeah. I one of the questions what have you ever experienced whitening of reflections after polymerization? I think the one case I showed of um Jeremy where I did that quadrant of teeth of his I mean, yes, I picked the composite, I picked too light of a shade and it got it got a little bit lighter after. I've never seen I wouldn't I wouldn't say significant whitening. No. A little bit? Yes. A lot, no. And what's this question? Safe in terms of okay. Um, what, one of the questions it said is there a safe technique in terms of treating children? Um, well, we, I mean, we we treat children. I want to say same as adults, similar to adults because they're children. So patient um, management standpoint is a little different, but we all. I try as much as I can to use rubber dam. It's, it's sometimes a little tougher on to explain to a little child why the, the features and benefits of a rubber dam versus an adult. It's pretty simple to do that. Um, but we do do a lot of composites on children, particularly in my practice, a lot of anterior composites. But we do posterior as well. So the, I mean, I don't think the technique's much different. Sometimes we can't get the rubber dam on just for um, we'll call it cooperation and. Uh, so then we're doing we're doing um, cot rolls or you know some doctors have isolite or something like that that they can use. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay. I mean, what's that about the composite? Let me grab. Can you blow that up a little bit? My time is a lot. Sorry, I just grabbed my reading glasses. We have questions popping in, and as you get older, you need bigger type to read. Uh, okay, is it possible to use reflections without modeling resin? Yes, um, you know that, that's a good question. I didn't mention modeling resin. I actually use that probably more than most doctors I know, and both in the anterior and the posterior. I mean, today we're talking about posterior, but modeling resin definitely makes my life easier. Could you use it without? Sure. I mean, every doctor handles their composite different and likes to have it handled different. I like it to be, you know, a little on the stiffer side, which reflections is sometimes. Um, modeling resin comes in handy at the margins when we talk about using a brush, a little artist brush, you can use that to smooth it down. 
So could you use it without? Yes. Most of the time I use modeling resin, whether and for both for reflections and for elite. Um, and one of the doctors asked about the material becoming lighter again after polymerization. And you know, I, I tried to describe that a little earlier. I, in my experience, I mean, I'm just one doctor, so it's my experience as one person, but I've I've seen the material. The material gets a little bit lighter, but I don't think it's significant. And um, it's just that uh, it's, it's something you have to kind of take into account when we talked about, um, you know, choosing the shade. If you think it's going to be a little too light, then you want to drop down in value into the gray or the neutral. And one of the doctors asked about using the modeling resin because of the stiffness of the material. I mean, modeling resin always makes everything easier to handle. Just that you don't want to, if you use it in excess, if you think about it, Modeling resin is modeling resin. It's pure resin, and it's not composite. So if you were to use it in excess, then you're, you're diluting down the physical properties of the composite. In other words, if you, get, if you incorporate too much of it into the composite you're using, you're basically you know, reducing the different physical properties, and you're changing the optical properties a little bit as well. Let's see. Uh, one of the questions we had from one members of the audience is, where is reflections indicated versus elite? Um, I, I think you know, when I try to look at one, in my office, when we use reflections, when we, we use elite, the differentiation would be, first of all, I think of, from my perspective, reflections is kind of like, I look at it as, it, as kind of a work ho workhorse, excuse me, composite, meaning you have, you have four dentins, you have four enamels, it's designed to be, uh, you know, to make life more efficient, to make life simpler, and you can use it. I still think you can use it in the majority of posterior situations. Um, Elite is a more aesthetic composite. Of course, you have more shade choices. So on one hand, you have more choices. On the other hand, you're gonna you're gonna be carrying more shades if you buy, you know, the whole kit. So for doctors who want to simplify. I think reflections, you know, speaks to that desire to have things more simple. And if you want a little more aesthetics, like I showed that case I did for the artist, then you want to have some more shade choices. Um, and it comes down to it's it's the same as why do doctors pick? You know, why do some doctors do self etch, some do toe etch? Some of it's based on science. Some of it's just based on our you know our personal choices on what we're more comfortable with. And the same with reflections and elite. Some doctors like the handling capabilities of one, some like the other. You know, I, I use them both. You know, I use elite more in the anterior. Um, so I hope that helps a little bit. Okay, let's see. Choose to paint. Um, one of the doctors asked, what do you use to, to color or paint the pits and the teeth? You can use... Um, there's characterization stains, which you can get from a variety of places. You can get them from, if you have a lab that you do um, indirect posterior composites with, you know, lab process composites, they will, you know, they can provide you with those. There's um, stains from the Tessera kit, um, Visco's indirect composite that I have at my office. We use those. There's all sorts of different colors in there. Um, you know, there's other companies that make uh, they just call them tints. They're tints. They're like a, they're basically a resin with color in it. And then you can paint them in there with anything that's tiny, um, an endophile, explorer, small instrument, anything like that. Um, from a clinical point of view, how do you best minimize micro leakage? Well, if we're talking about a class two composite, I would say through a couple factors. Um, one is using a flowable composite in the box, because if you've, if you've seen any of the studies, I mean, there's been hundreds of studies done since probably 1996, 1997 on dye penetration studies into class two composites. And there's, um, there's a huge difference between using a flowable and not using a flowable in a class two. Class twos without flowable tend to have air trapped in them, in them, excuse me, they tend to have, which allows more micro leakage. They also have, um, you know, a, a 
Foldable composite's kind of a little bit stretchable. It's elastomeric. So when it cures um, and you know, you, the stresses are induced into it when the, the light activation or light curing happens, then that material is better able to take it than, say, you know, a straight hybrid composite. So from a clinical point of view, how do you best minimize microleakage? One, use a flowable composite um, in the proximal box. Um, two, or I should have said, you know, A1 would be good isolation, and then use a flowable composite. Make sure that any bands or matrices you're using are as tight and well adapted as possible, which is why I like V3s and um, Garrison's. And just following protocol, uh, making sure you follow adhesive protocol. Um, sometimes we get in a rush and we want to speed up and we want to do things a little quicker and a little faster. And in the end, you know, what's the most expensive thing we have? Chair time, doctor chair time. So if we have to redo a restoration six months from now or two years from now because we cut a little time, save 10 seconds somewhere, that we really didn't save anything we lost big time. And the patient loses because they have to get a restoration redone. Um, any other questions? Comments? Anything happening? No. Um, what do you wait? <laughs> We're scanning the question box here. So if you hear a little silence, do that. Okay. Okay. Uh, Any other questions? That's all right. That's all right. All right. Okay. I think that's looks like we've pretty much addressed all the questions. If you have any additional ones, I didn't pop up. Is this still up on the presentation? I don't know if it is. If, if you do have any questions, I invite you know any of the attendees, doctors, distributors, whoever took the time, and we do appreciate your time to, to take out of your day to listen in here. Some people had to get up early. Some people had to stay up late. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me anytime at my office. Um, you can reach me through my website, smilesbymorgan.com, and if you have any questions, if there's anything I can help you with, I, honestly, I'd be more than happy to do that. Or you can um, contact Maggie or anybody at PISCO, and they'll get their, your question through to me as well. So thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, we look forward to seeing you folks next time. We'll be talking a little bit about anterior teeth. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you later. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.